Okay, in the last session, we talked about conscience and the blood that was able to actually cause all the enemies in our conscience uh, to be cast down. Now, we're going to pick up uh, something in Hebrews uh, 10 and see how basically this conscience, blood, and heart are something that the Bible constantly speaks of and they're being basically uh, related. Look at chapter 10. Actually, let's start from verse 15. It says, But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Okay, remember that we said Jesus stooped down in John chapter 8 in last session, and he wrote on the ground. So what was he doing? He was writing the new law. That was symbolic to say that actually he's the one who has the right to write uh, in our heart and in our mind. And he says, this is the covenant that I will make. And the covenant is the writing of the law of the Lord in our heart and in our mind. And remember, that's not the law of the Lord that was Pharisees and scribes bringing. It is the law of the Lord, which is the law of spirit itself. Okay. Now, if you look at uh, verse 17, he says, Then he adds, Their sin and lawless deeds I will remember no more. Remember Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you to the woman. That's like, it's like, I don't even remember what you have done. Because the moment I say, I don't condemn you, that means there is nothing wrong about you anymore. So you can be free in your conscience. And he says, this is our new covenant, right? Now, when Jesus uh, in the Last Supper took up the cup of the wine, he says, this is the blood of the new covenant. So what causes the law of the Lord to be written in our heart and in our mind is first that blood that causes that to be purged. So God can say new law in your heart. Wow. No condemnation. Right? In verse 18. Now, where there is remission of these, what are the these? Sins and lawlessness. Where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. So if God says, I don't remember, he does not remember. So when somebody reminds you of that, that's not first God. Second, it's not from the new covenant. Third, it's not according to the blood of the new covenant. Fourth, it's not according to the spirit of grace. And yet God in Zechariah uh, 12, we saw that he says, in that day I will pour out the spirit of grace on them. Right? Look at uh, chapter 10, verse 29. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant which he was sanctified a common thing, a common thing, and insulted the spirit of grace? This is Zechariah, the blood, the spirit of grace, the Son of God. The whole thing. He says, um, there is nothing other than the blood of Jesus. There is nothing than grace of the Lord Jesus. And there is nothing other than uh, the new covenant that can save us. If the blood cannot do it, nothing else would be able to. That means stick to the blood. That means don't allow anybody like that woman to bring you to Jesus, to accuse you before him. Because you should be able to actually defend yourself. If you go and study the word accu ac to accuse, 90% um, of the time it's used in the book of Acts. It's in the story of Paul who is being accused and is constantly defending him himself. Not 
Now, that is the defense is happening in the conscience. That means he has, um, he has put himself in a place that he's knowing nothing except Jesus and his blood and grace and spirit. That's how he lives. Okay? That causes the spirit, that, that causes the conscience of man to be in a place that he can now hear God. Because the conscience is open. The door is open. Jesus knocked on our door. We open and he's in us and we are eating and drinking with him. Okay. Now look at chapter uh, 10, verse 18 once again. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Therefore, because there is no longer an offering, that means because the offering has already made, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, that's the blood, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. So we have the body, the flesh of Jesus, and the blood of Jesus. He says these two, and having a high priest over the house of God, actually... Uh, this is a wrong translation. First of all, the word having is not there. It's italic. That's what they put there. And the word high must be the word great. It should be being a great priest over the house of God. He's not speaking concerning Jesus. He's speaking concerning you. He says you being a great priest over your own house. You have the blood in your hand. You have the flesh that is already open the high priest is already inside you as the priest take the blood and go inside okay so let's then with this understanding read it again from verse 19 therefore brethren having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and a great priest over the house of God. Now he says, let us draw near with a true heart. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Do you think the woman in adultery had full assurance of faith? No. She was condemned. She was accused. She was there to see what Jesus is going to say. She didn't know what Jesus is going to say. Now he says, um, with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Our hearts sprinkled from evil conscience. He calls this the true heart. So we had a heart that had evil conscience now he says the blood he says the blood sprinkles the blood sprinkles the conscience which was evil basically it um, it sprinkles the heart that had evil conscience okay so the result of this would be a heart with, you're going to see what kind of conscience. Okay? So here, the sprinkling can. And it says, this is now called a true heart, which has full assurance of faith. Verse uh, 23, let us hold fast the confession of hope without wavering. He says the true heart is the one that can hold fast 
the confession of hope without wavering. That means the heart with evil conscience cannot hold fast the confession of hope. Right? So what causes somebody to be able to actually be changed from a person that is not able to hold fast the confession of hope to somebody that can hold fast the confession of hope? The blood. The blood. Okay? The blood can help me to be from a place of a person that was wavering to a person that can be firm in f- hope. Right? Let's go to First Timothy. Chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandments of God, our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. To Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they may, that they teach no other doctrine. That means in Ephesus there were people that were teaching other doctrines. Nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies. That means there were people that were giving heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. So the only edification that we can have is through faith, not genealogies, and definitely not fables. It's only faith. Okay, now we're going to see what he's trying to say. Now, the end, the, okay, the purpose. The word purpose must be the end. Now, the end of the commandment is love. Okay, go to verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God. An apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God. Verse 5. Now the end of the commandment. What is the commandment? Paul was an apostle by the commandment of God. He says the end of this commandment is love from a pure heart and from a good heart conscience and from a sincere faith, love, from a pure, a good, a sincere, pure heart, good conscience, sincere faith. In Hebrews 10, we read that he says, our heart previously had evil conscience. But now, because of the sprinkling of the blood, our heart can have a different conscience. Here he says, we have something called good conscience. Now he says, a heart with a good conscience is a true heart. And that has the full assurance of faith. Now you come here and he says, the end of the commandment of God for Paul to be an apostle of Jesus Christ is to bring the love of God to his people. Mm-hmm. He's being sent. He's an apostle. He's not false apostle. He's not transforming himself into apostle of Christ. He is the apostle of Christ. And his com- the commandment is love. Now that love, he says, is only from a pure heart is only from a good conscience and it's only from sincere faith. That means Paul had these qualities. He had a pure heart, he had a good conscience, and he he had a sincere faith. In um, 
in his epistles and also in the book of Acts, he constantly says, I have, um, I have tried uh, to keep my conscience void of offense toward God and man. So he was in a place that constantly was without offense in his conscience. Okay? Now, the only thing that can keep you in that place is the sprinkling of the blood. That means Paul was able, Paul was actually, no, uh, he knew how to take the blood of Jesus in his conscience. That means Paul was the one that actually um, knew how to fight. Right? Okay. That means he knew how to be a priest. Now, look at verse 5 once again. Now, the end of the commandment is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith, from which some having strayed have turned aside to idle talk. From which people have turned away from love to idle talk. But he says, love that I'm saying is not like a commandment that you have to keep. You can't have love if you don't have these qualities. Because under the law of Moses, people had the commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. But they couldn't. But Paul says now it's possible. To love because Jesus said you can he said love one another just as I have loved you now he says that love is a fruit of a pure heart a pure heart it's a result as a fruit of a good conscience and sincere faith and all this is because of the blood you see here heart conscience and full assurance of faith Okay, that means unless you actually learn how to use, how to go through the veil, which is his flesh, Hebrews 10, having the blood and be inside, you will never have a flow of love. Verse 6, he says, from which some having strayed have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law. Okay? So idle talk is from those who desire to become a teacher of the law and not revealing the mysteries of the blood of Jesus and the flesh of Jesus, the new covenant. Mm -hmm. Teachers of the law teach you old covenant. Mm -hmm. That's right. But those who actually know about the mystery of Christ, they would have nothing to know except Christ and Him crucified. Even though they have full knowledge concerning the law, like Paul, but he says, I will count them all rubbish, that I may gain Christ. That means with law, you would never have Christ. Okay? You need something different. It has to be a different way of living. Everything must be, become new. There is not a single thing that will remain old. The covenant must be changed, the priest must be changed, the law must be changed, the tabernacle must be changed, the mercy seat must, everything must become new. You can't take anything from the old and bring it to the new, nothing at all. Now it says, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say, nor the things which they affirm. Okay? Now he says, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Now imagine, he just said some people want to be, have turned aside from this and they desire to be teachers of the law and they have become idle talkers. And he says, now law, we know law is good. Law is not bad. But let's see what he says. If one uses it lawfully, if you can use it lawfully, then use it and you don't need Jesus. Okay? 
Verse 9, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and in, insubordinate, for the ungodly, for sinners, for the unholy and profane, murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, manslayers, for fornicators and sodomites and kidnappers, for liars, for uh, perjurers. And if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Okay, he says law was for unrighteous. When you become righteous, if you live by the law, you're sinning. That's right. Because law is not of faith. Yeah. And everything that is not of faith is sin. Yeah. Now, the problem with the law is, because the moment the law comes, it brings with it everything. Yeah. It's accusation, it's judgment, it's condemnation, everything. It's not the law that brings it. Your conscience is not able to handle that. Mm -hmm. You need the blood of Jesus that can purge your conscience, which the law was not able to do, so that he himself can sit there. Remember, the blood is on the Ark of the Covenant, which had the mercy seat. Everybody knows this, right? Under the Old Covenant, there was, in the most holy place that he says now come into, there was an Ark of the Covenant, and on top of the Ark, was a layer of gold called mercy seat and blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat okay so let me just put it here okay so there was an ark of the covenant and then a layer on top called mercy seat so the high priest would take the blood and would shed it, sprinkle this here. Here was the sprinkling of blood. And of course you know that here there were two cherubims. So the mercy seat was basically between the two cherubim. Okay, now what he says, the sprinkling is happening actually in the heart. In the old covenant, there was a literal tabernacle outside of you on earth. And it had a mercy seat that was outside of you. In the new covenant, you have the mercy seat inside. Okay? So, then there is a need for blood to be on the ark, on the mercy seat, right? Okay, what was inside the ark? One of the things was the tablet of commandments, yes. the law, which was also called the testimony, mm. right? He says, God said, I will write in their heart my law. Yet not the law of Moses, my law, the new law. Okay, this was a box, the Ark of the Covenant. So God says, I will put my law in their heart. But under the old covenant, the law was in the ark. But God says in the new covenant, I will put my law in the heart. So where is the ark? Your heart. Where is the mercy seat that has the blood? Your conscience. Okay, now he says, if this doesn't happen, nothing inside of man would be changed. So you're, you give a man a law that is external and you say do it and he tries to do it but the evil conscience does not allow him to do it because there is no faith and if there is no faith you can't do anything you say I will do it but then a minute later you just don't do it 
But when actually your heart is purged from that conscience, you say you do it and then you do it. Because you have the power now to do it. Because you believe and when you believe, your heart is able to believe. In believing, you receive grace. And by doing so, that grace causes you to be able to live a life of love from a pure heart, a good conscience, a sincere faith. None of these things are from you. It's the blood that purifies the heart. It's the blood that gives you a good conscience that is able to actually keep the confession of hope. And it's the blood that brings the faith. Okay? Now go to chapter 2. Actually look at chapter 1. Verse 15, 1 okay. Timothy, we are still in 1 Timothy. It says, this is a faithful saying, or faithful word actually, this is a faithful word, and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy. Where is the mercy received? In the conscience. I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern. As a pattern. To those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Paul says, look at my life. My life is a pattern. The life of Paul is a pattern. That's why we hear things like he has a commandment from God. Love from a pure heart, good conscience, sincere faith. He says these are the things you should be looking for. In, uh, I think it's in 2 Timothy or maybe Philippians that he says, the things that you have read from me, the things that you have heard, the things that you have seen in me, these things do. Paul says, follow me, right? So, because he's a pattern, he's a pattern because through him, Jesus is showing that how actually the pattern of eternal life works. It's because people came to him and said, what must we do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, if you want to do, you already know what you need to do. Do the commandments. And he says, people said, what, which one? every one of them. You're not supposed to miss any of them if you want to do the law. But now he says, for those who want to have everlasting life, I say, I'm a pattern. I've been chosen as a pattern. So that God, through the, I obtain mercy, and because of the obtaining of mercy, I have a pure heart, I have a good conscience, I have a sincere faith, and I'm a pattern. Uh, and then verse 17, he says, now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God, who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Now, verse 18, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage, you may fight, you may fight the good warfare, you may fight, having faith and a good conscience. Okay, once again, he says, uh, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may fight the good uh, warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected, what have they rejected? Faith and a good conscience. Which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. Their faith is shipwrecked. What are they doing? They're back to the law. And they no more have a pure heart. They no more have a good conscience. They no more have a sincere faith. That's why there is no more love. They've become idol talkers, teachers of the law. 
of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now you should remember last session. Okay, look at chapter 3. Likewise, uh, chapter 3, verse 8. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. Holding the mystery of faith with a pure conscience. That means if you don't have a pure conscience, there is not going to be any faith. But more than that, this faith is a mystery. It's not just, I'm going to have faith for this, I'm going to have faith for that. Yeah. It's a mystery. Yeah. Okay, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14 and 15. He said, um, If the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sanctifies for sprinkling the unclean, how much more shall the blood of Christ... I skip a few words. Purify your conscience. The word cleanse is purify. Purify your conscience. That means if you're, you have a purification of conscience, you're going to have a pure conscience. Now he says you can only hold the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. But pure conscience is the result of the blood. Okay. I'm getting somewhere. There's lots of data, but... We're getting somewhere. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. Step, let's stop here. He says the reason somebody can hold the mystery of faith is because of a pure conscience. But the pure conscience is the result of the blood. So blood is something that caused something, somebody to hold the mystery of faith. But he says in the latter days, some people will depart from the faith. Why? Because the blood of Jesus, they are trampling underfoot. And they count it, he says, as a common thing. The word common means like, that blood and the other blood, there is no difference. The blood of bulls and the blood of Jesus, there is no difference. There is no power in the blood of Jesus. So that's why they say, okay, the blood of Jesus couldn't do anything for me. So how about me keeping some laws? And they depart from the faith. But let's see where this comes. He says, depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits. That means it takes deception for somebody to go back here. It takes deception to forget the blood of Jesus and return to a system that never helped anybody. Nobody was perfected. It says the law was not able to make anybody perfect. But he says in the beginning, all the context is already said in the beginning, chapter 1. He says, all that I'm saying is about a group of people that they, are, they have become idol talkers. They're, they desire to become teachers of the law. But they don't understand what they're saying. They don't understand that the law was not made for the righteous. But the righteous shall live by faith. But in the latter days, some will depart from the faith. And it's because they're giving heed to deceiving spirits. and doctrines of demons. Deceiving spirits have doctrine of demons, but there are people that are giving heed to them. And they are the ones that are teaching other people. And they cause people to, first of all, they are, being, they are departing from the faith but they also cause your conscience to depart from faith. So they start giving, they start gathering 
together yeah. in the place called Armageddon. Yeah. Yeah. And unless there is a fight between Michael and his angels and the dragon and his angels in your conscience, they will not be cast down. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay, so doctrine of demons and deceiving spirits. You don't know, need to go there. I quickly read this for you because we already covered this in the last session. This is Revelation 16, verse 13. He says, And I saw, there, I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of beasts, and out of the mouth of false prophets. For they are spirits of demons. Wow. He said, In the latter days, some would give heed to, spir to deceiving spirits, to doctrine of demons. Now here he says, These are spirits of demons performing signs and wonders, which go out to the kings of the earth, yeah. people, and of the whole world, to gather them together to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. But Jesus says, behold, I'm coming, or behold, the thief is coming, basically. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garment. Paul says, I'm keeping it. This is your garment. Yeah. I mean, there is more details. I'm just, your conscience being covered with these things, that's your garment. He says, the thief is coming to come against this. Hold the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. Don't give heed to spirits of demons. Don't give heed to doctrine of demons. Don't give heed to people that actually teach you those things. Only take the blood of Jesus and that's it. And let your conscience come to a purity so that you can come to a place that you can come to draw near to God with full assurance of faith. So that you can hold fast the confession of hope because now God is revealing to you. Because one of the things that God said, He said to Moses when He made this... Uh, tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant, after putting the Ark and the Mercy Seat and the Cherubim, he said, between the Cherubim, on the Mercy Seat, I will speak to you. That means when the blood is being shed, you will hear the voice of God. Okay? If the voice is not heard, and we said this is in conscience, and Jesus said, I knock on the door. Right? Okay, if it's not hurt, let me show you the verse. Go to, uh, I think it's, it must be Second Timothy. Yeah, let's go to Second Timothy. Okay, Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. So it's not a promise of death. It's a promise of life. To Timothy, a beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, or actually it should be having the grace of God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, pure conscience, with the mystery of faith. He says, I'm serving God. You want to serve God? Receive His blood first, because that's Him serving you first. Unless you're being served by Him, you will not be able to serve Him. So if He serves you with His blood, then you will have a pure conscience. Then you can serve Him. Why? Because you're going to be in the mystery of faith. And you're going to have an ear that is open to hear what the Spirit says, not to follow the dictates of evil heart. You follow what He says. And that's love. From a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Okay, now let's go to the verse that I wanted to show you. Okay, let's go to, before that, 1 Corinthians 10, 
chapter 10 of 1st Corinthian let's look at verse 16 the cup verse 16 the cup of blessing which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ how much more shall the blood of Christ purify your conscience right the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we though many are one bread and one body, for we, are, we all partake of that one bread. So we partake of the bread. Observe Israel after the flesh. That means look at old Israel. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altars? So that means those who eat of the sacrifices partake of the altar. Right. Now it says we partake of the bread. Mm -hmm. Verse 19, what am I saying then? That an idol is anything or what is offered to idol is anything? No. Rather, the things which, which Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. Okay. You cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. The cup of the Lord is what purifies your conscience yeah. with the blood. Mm -hmm. there, in the last days, there will be deceiving spirits mm -hmm. with doctrines of demons, mm -hmm. causing you to depart from the faith. Mm -hmm. okay? Now he says, I don't want you to partake of demons cup. I, wanna, I want you to be partaker of the blood of the Lord right but do you drink the blood of the Lord no, no. you drink wine mm -hmm. but does that do anything to you just taking that many people do it but he says in fact many are dead already many are sick many are weak because they don't know the worthy manner to take it so that means when I say the cup of demons and the cup of the Lord, I'm not really talking about drinking wine or blood. I'm speaking of doctrines, mm -hmm. teachings. And he says, I don't want to be partakers of the doctrine of demons. Verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Why jealousy? Because he's a husband. Second oh, Corinthians 11, he said, I've betrothed you to one husband mm -hmm. with godly jealousy. How? He says to the Jesus that I introduced to you. Right? Okay. Go back to 1 Timothy. So let's see now doctrine of demons and doctrine of Christ, the Lord. Drinking two different cup. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. If the conscience was purged, they would hear the voice of God. But he says now, their conscience is seared. They're not going to hear God. And the reason for this was the giving heed to the doctrine of demons. And that was to part, be partaker of the cup of demons. Mm -hmm. 
and not the cup of the Lord. So in simple language, the teaching that is against grace of Jesus and mercy of Jesus does not recognize the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus because his body is grace and his blood is mercy. Jesus said, whoever drinks of my flesh and my blood shall never taste death. Whoever receives my grace and my mercy shall never taste death. Now he says, some are already dead and it's just because what they're doing, they're being partaking of the cup of demons. There is a blood already shed, but that's like a common thing because they just drink it and there is no, they're not anymore actually, they drink it with condemnation <laughs> rather than drinking that with justification. Yeah. Right? Okay, now all of this was happening on, in the Old Testament because of something called the Ark of the Covenant which would have the blood and then the law would be inside. And we said the new covenant has the new blood and has the law written in our hearts, which says no condemnation. It's the law of the spirit of life. It gives life, right? Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 3. Okay, so imagine this is real stories under the old covenant happening, but all of them were foreshadowing of what is happening now in the church okay that's why when under the in the old covenant we have david uh, in the new covenant we have jesus as the king under in the old covenant we have joshua who took people out of uh, let's say wilderness into the promised land under the new covenant we have new joshua which is jesus himself that is doing this if we had let's say a tabernacle under the Old Covenant, we have a tabernacle. So this story, we're going to see actually what God is trying to say. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 12. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, backsliding Israel, says the Lord. I will not cause my anger to fall on you, for I am merciful. Do you see mercy? I am merciful, says the Lord. I will not remain angry forever. Only acknowledge, acknowledge your iniquity that you have transgressed against the Lord your God and have scattered your charms to alien deities under every green tree and you have not obeyed my voice, says the Lord. Return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. Do you see, do we provoke him to jealousy? 1 yeah. Corinthians 10, mm -hmm. as husband? Yeah. God says, I'm married to you. I will take you, one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Hebrews 12 says, you have not come to a mountain that burned with fire, speaking of Mount Sinai, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, and to Jesus, the mediator of new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better words, mm. right? So he says, I will bring you to Zion, and I will give you shepherds. Mm. Who are the shepherds? The teachers, mm -hmm. those who feed the sheep. If we are the sheep, what is our food? Doctrine. doctrine. But what kind of doctrine are you supposed to drink? Yeah. The cup. Not of not demons, yeah. the cup of the Lord, yeah. his blood and his mercy, his blood and his uh, body, which is his mercy and his grace. So true shepherds, good shepherd feeds you with mercy and grace. Okay. And I will give you shepherds according to my heart, not your evil heart. Your evil heart wants to uproot everybody. But my heart is love. And he says, my shepherds are going to be after my heart. That's why Paul says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God. Okay. Now he says, according to my heart, who will feed you with knowledge 
and understanding. That means true shepherds would give you knowledge and understanding. They wouldn't tell you what to do. They would give you knowledge and understanding concerning your God. Okay? Now, look at verse 16. Then it shall come to pass, when you are multiplied and increased in the land in those days, says the Lord, that they will say no more, they will say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Imagine, he says there will come a day that they will never again say the ark of the covenant of the Lord. He says, it shall not come to mind. What is not going to come to mind? The ark of the covenant of the Lord. Nor shall they remember it, the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Nor shall they visit it, the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Nor shall it be made anymore, the ark of the covenant of the Lord. It shall never be made again. Right? Why? Because at that time, Jerusalem, okay, he said, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the new Jerusalem. Right? Okay. He says, the reason I say you shall not remember this one, because I'm bringing a new one. This was the Ark of the Covenant of the Old Covenant. We have the Ark of the Covenant of the New Covenant. And he says, in that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord. Revelation 21 says, I saw New Jerusalem coming down from heaven as a bride. Who is the husband? God, married to her. He says, that bride is going to be the throne of God himself. Right? I will take you one from a city, two from a family. I will bring you to Zion. And in that day, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of God. But you have come to this Mount Zion, and you have come to this near Jerusalem. So you're supposed to be the throne of God. And the nations shall be gathered to it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. The name of the Lord is going to be in Jerusalem. Listen to this. What have we been talking about? Heart, evil conscience, and only the blood could do this. And he said that was because of an ark. Right? Look at here. No more shall they follow the dictates of their evil hearts. Okay. <laughs> he says, we have a blood that is for the sprinkling of our hearts from evil conscience. There was an ark that had a mercy seat that the sprinkling of the blood was done. The ark being the heart, the mercy seat is the place that needs the blood, which is conscience. That would cause a purification to happen here. He says that would give you a heart with a clear, a pure conscience. And that would cause you not to follow the dictates of your evil heart, because there is no more evil conscience. Okay? He says, this is new covenant. And this will cause you to be the throne of God. Because this was called in the old covenant, the throne of God. Go to uh, Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man. So who are you going to trust in? Then what happens? You were blessed. It says the reason somebody is cursed because they trust in man. The reason somebody is blessed because he's trusting God. And makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. 
The Lord does not depart from him. His heart departs from the Lord. Now, let's see what he's trying to say. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when the good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. Now, that was the cursed, the cursed man, whose strength is the flesh and who trusts its man. But verse 7, but blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. We are going to hold fast the confession of our hope. Why? Because this happened. The blood is sprinkled, our heart is purified, and we are able to trust in the Lord. We can have the full assurance of faith and we are going to hold the confession of our hope. Verse 8, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters. Sounds like Revelation 22, tree of life. Which spreads out its root by the river and will not fear, or actually the word must be see, and will not see when the heat comes. Okay, look at verse 6. He said, he shall not see when the good comes the cursed man, yeah. but the blessed man will not see when the heat comes. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> but its leaf sh will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought. Why? Because he's trusting in the Lord. Mm. Nor will cease from yielding fruit. Mm. So it's the, day of, it's the year of drought, but his leaf is green yeah. and he's bearing fruit. So the drought is not an issue to him, and he shall not see heat. Yeah. That's the blessed man. Yeah. Verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. Okay. And desperately wicked. Who can know it? The heart is deceitful above all things. The word deceitful is the word crooked. The heart is crooked. The heart is crooked. Quickly, let's go to Isaiah chapter 40. I just want to show you how if inside nothing happens, nothing is going to happen outside. There is not going to be any good in God to come on earth if he can't come to the heart of man. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 40 verse 1. Comfort. Yeah. Yes, comfort my people, says, the, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord make straight in the desert a highway for our God every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places were in the heart. The heart is more crooked, is crooked above all things. How was the preparing the way of the Lord happening? By making every crooked place in the heart. Ready. Unless he can purge our heart with his blood. He cannot sit on our heart. Hebrews 1 verse 3 says, when he made purification of our sin, he sat down. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so, and every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. What are we 
what is he trying to make? A street that has no valley, no mountain. So the desert's in your heart then. Yeah. He's making a street mm. of pure gold. That's right. Revelation chapter 21. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Wow. Where? In you. And all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice said, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry? This is what he said, cry. All flesh is as grass. So remember when John the Baptist came, he actually, uh, the, the, the gospel say that this was the voice that said, crying in the wilderness. So now John the Baptist again did something externally. That must happen inside of the heart of man. John the Baptist did something, it, had, it profited. Jesus did something 2,000 years ago that profited me nothing until the day that I came to actually have him crucified in me or me crucified with him on the cross. Same way, what John the Baptist did was, was just a demonstration of what needs to happen in the heart of man. So he says, all flesh is grass and all the loveliness is like the its loveliness is like the flower of the field the grass withers and the flower fades because the breath of the lord blows upon it surely the people are grass the grass withers and the flower fades but the word of the lord our god stands forever First Peter chapter 1, verse 25. Yeah. But you have been born of the incorruptible seed yeah. of the word of God that remains. Yeah. So that means the grass was not the word of the Lord. Mm. It was another word in the heart. Mm. So grass are people, right? Mm. People, but what kind of people? Because uh, even though, let's say, when, um, they got, when the Bible speaks of, let's say, um, things concerning man inside, he also concern, externally speaks of a man as that way. For example, he speaks of the well-being inside of us, but then in Jude, he says, these are wells without waters. So he says, a person can be a well for because he was supposed to be a well springing up eternal life. But at the same time, that person has the well inside of him. So the same way, he says, people are grass, but then uh, what was growing in their heart was grass instead of the word of the Lord. That's right. Yeah. So that's why Jesus said, the mysteries of the kingdom has been given to you, and that's like a man who sowed a seed, and the seed was the word of the kingdom that was going to bring forth fruit hundredfold at the end, right? Now he says, all these things are happening in the heart. And without this blood, none of these things will happen. So that means a pure conscience is, something, is a gift that God wants to give us because of the blood of Jesus, right? Okay, now look at verse uh, nine. He says, O Zion, you who bring good tidings, the gospel. So, Zion has the gospel. We have the gospel. Get up to the high mountain, O Jerusalem. That means don't stand low. You who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord shall come with a strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Revelation 22, verse 12. Behold, his reward is with him. 
and his work, his work, not your work, his work before him, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. Remember, he said, I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. He says, now he's coming to feed you as a shepherd. And because of that, you can receive the reward of the knowledge that he's giving you. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span and calculated the dust of earth in measure, weighted the mountains in scales and the hills in balance. Look at verse 13. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or has, as his counselor has taught him. This is the word that he says, who has the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him. Romans chapter 11, verse 33, and 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But we have the mind of Christ. Verse 14, with whom did he take counsel? With whom and who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment. Okay, let's stop here. So uh, let's go back to Jeremiah. So remember, we're not going to be grass. That's right. We're going to be a tree. Yes. And he said, the voice said, there is, there is a need for preparing the way of the Lord. And he said, that means every valley down, every valley up, every mountain down, prepare a highway for the Lord, a street which Revelation tells us that street is also a river. Beside it is the tree of life, right? Okay, now look at chapter 17 of Jeremiah. Verse 7, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its root by the river, and will not see when heat comes but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. The heart, all of a sudden, from all that picture, he gets to the heart. Yeah. That means all of that is in the heart. The heart is crooked above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. Revelation chapter 2, verse 23. Jesus said, yeah. we're going to read it. I, the Lord, search the heart, and I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. We're going to go later to Revelation. Look at verse 12. A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. He said, Jerusalem, in chapter 3, he said, you shall never again remember the ark, nor you will say to make it or visit it. And he said, because Jerusalem shall be called the throne of God, and the name of the Lord shall be there. He, here he says, a glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of uh, our sanctuary. A glorious high throne is going to be the place of our sanctuary. But the whole context is the heart. Jeremiah 17. A man who trusts in man, a man who trusts in the Lord. Where? In the heart. With the heart man believes. So the throne. He says, a glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you, shall be ashamed. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth, not in heaven. There, there were those who were dwelling on earth in Revelation. There were those who were dwelling in heaven. And he says, woe to those who are dwelling on the earth and in the sea. That's to say, this is a condition of heart. Those who depart from me, okay, look at verse, chapter uh, 17, verse 5. 
Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from me, yeah. from the Lord, right? An evil heart of unbelief, Departing from yeah. Hebrews chapter 3. Yeah. Now, you have verse 5 that says, Whose heart departs from me. Verse uh, 9 said, Heart is crooked above all things. Verse 13 said, Those who depart from me shall be written. That means those who in their heart depart from me. What causes somebody to be departing from? He says, 1 Timothy chapter, was it 1 Timothy? I think chapter 4, verse 1. In the last days, Spirit expressly says that some will depart from the faith. Giving heed to, okay, all I'm saying, I'm not saying try to fix your heart. I'm saying he, take the right cup. Hear not deceiving spirits, hear the Lord. That's right. Because unless He hears, He talks to you, you cannot have hope in Him. Yeah. So, just to make sure, I'm not saying your heart is deceitful and crooked and you have to do something about it. I'm saying nothing can actually do anything other than the blood of Jesus for the heart. That means it's only by the power of God that your heart can be changed. Right. It was by His grace that we were saved. And it was by faith, true faith, that we were saved. And both were the gift from God, Ephesians 2. Okay, now here it says, shall, uh, those who depart from me, meaning in the heart, shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of the living waters. The fountain of living waters is the Lord Himself. Mm. Concerning Jesus, we read in Revelation chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 21. He says He shall shepherd them to the fountain of living waters. Mm, that's right. That's right. But He says, the good shepherd I will give after my own heart, they shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Shepherd, Jesus would shepherd us with knowledge and understanding to that we can come and draw near to our God. Because our heart was departing itself from the living God. But now he says he can bring us so we can draw closer to our God. And he says that's having the blood of Jesus and having the veil, which is his flesh, Hebrews chapter 10, we can draw near to him. Right? Uh, Titus 1, verse 10. For there are many insubordinate. The word insubordinate means um, somebody who is not subject to or does not subject himself to. Hmm. Now, who are you going to subject yourself to the Lord, the husband? He says, for there are many insubordinate, both idol talkers, we talked about this in Timothy, idol talkers and deceivers. These words now should be familiar to your ears. Yeah. Idol talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. What is the word circumcision is used for? Those who come with the background of Judaism, yeah. law. But they're believers. Mm -hmm. They're believers, like the book of Acts chapter 15, it says, uh, some of the Pharisees who believed said that Gentiles must keep the law of Moses and also be circumcised. Mm -hmm. They keep the, and there was a dispute and they talked together, apostles, they got together and there was a conclusion coming out that we should not put a burden on them that we ourselves were not able to handle. Right. And we should not tempt God by doing so, yeah. right? Okay, he says, especially those who have of the circumcision, for these are insubordinate, idol talkers. Verse 11, whose mouth must be stopped. Sounds like Revelation chapter 16. The mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the false prophet, the mouth deceiving spirits. Whose mouth must be stopped, who subvert whole households. Teaching, do you see teaching? Teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. 
One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, <laughs> evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Do you see how he puts faith against being idle talker according to circumcision? Verse 14, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. Verse 15, to the pure. Okay, where was the purity? What would purify? The blood. What, what would happen? The heart would be purified from an evil conscience. Mm -hmm. So a heart would have a good conscience. He says, to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled, that means not pure, that means in their conscience, and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Mm -hmm. So that means it's not what you take or what you know that matters. It's the conscience that you take it in. Nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience are defiled. But conscience was supposed to be pure, refined. But he says now it's defiled. And it's all because of verse 10. Insubordinate, idol talkers, deceivers of the circumcision. Now verse 16. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him being abominable. That's because... They can't, they can't, because there is no pure heart, there is no good conscience, there is no sincere faith, therefore there is no love. He says, in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified. The word is disproved. Disproved. James chapter 1. The proving of your faith. They are disproved concerning the faith. For every good work. Okay, look at verse 11, and I'll finish by this. Chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God. For the grace of God that brings salvation. So the grace of God brings salvation. Has appeared to all men, teaching. So the grace is a teacher. Not anymore law is your tutor. Grace is teacher teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly. So we don't basically deny ungodly, ungodliness and worldly lusts because the law says so. It's because grace teaches us so. Because grace is bringing us salvation. Okay? And we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Actually, it should be looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, where? On the cross, where the blood blood was shed. So he's pointing at the blood and the body immediately. See how every time Paul directs his teaching toward this direction? Verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify. Where? In the conscience. Purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Because he says, unless you have the pure yeah. heart, good conscience, sincere faith, you would not be zealous for good works. Yeah. Yeah. Speak these things, exhort, rebuke with all authority, and let no one despise you. Okay? Now, look at verse, verse 3. Remind them, chapter 3, verse 1. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, 
to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of, evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were, not are, we were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, um, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. Amen. Not when the law appeared. Yes. When the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. Not by the work of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his great mercy. Why? Yeah. Mercy, mercy by the blood. Yeah. To do what? To get your heart fixed. Mm -hmm. To get your conscience that was the place of fight, constantly, mm -hmm. fixed. Mm -hmm. Now he says, not by the works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing mm -hmm. of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified, so you are justified, mm -hmm. who can condemn? If God is for us, who can condemn? That having been justified by His, not by keeping of the law, by grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying. And these things I want you to affirm constantly, not to be idle babbler. These things constantly, that it was by grace that you were saved when the kindness appeared, the love of our God, and we should be looking for the appearing of His glory. Wow. That those who believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. But avoid, once again, foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about, it says, don't even talk about the law. Don't even dispute, because some want to talk. For they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive man after, after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. Of course. Verse 15, to all who are with me, greet you, all who are with me, greet you, greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. Okay? So, back to the beginning of where we started. We started with Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, that he says, having the blood and the body of Jesus, let us draw near holding the confession of our hope. Okay? And we covered this through Jeremiah, and we saw it in Isaiah, that the crooked places, the desert places, and the heat and the drought and all those things are in the heart. The fountain is in the heart. You have knowledge and understanding either in your heart or you have foolishness and misunderstanding, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Everything is in the heart and conscience of man because... The Spirit has been given to us, but an, unless we have the Spirit of revelation and wisdom, we will never have understanding and knowledge. Ephesians chapter 1. He says, I pray that God may grant you the Spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. So you have knowledge and understanding. And God said, I will feed them with knowledge and understanding. But he says, the spirit of revelation and wisdom gives you knowledge and understanding. But the, it's all in the heart. So from the spirit, there is a, a work that he's doing in the heart of man. Okay? So the heart of man is the place that had gr grass, but must have a tree now. It was a place that w had um, broken cisterns, but now must have the fountain of living waters. Wow. It's a place that had 
valleys and mountains, sorry, valleys and mountains, but now must have a street, a river. It was a place that actually the dictates of the hearts were ruling, but now it's a place that is the leading of the spirit is happening. So no more the following of the dictates of our hearts, which is also, according to Old Testament, several verses, idols. Even idolatry in the heart. So then the city of idol is in the heart. So the whole book of Revelation is something that is doing, God is doing in man, internally. So he can change man internally. Because Jesus said, unless you clean the inside of the cup, the outside will not be clean. But if you clean the inside, guess what? The outside is going to be clean. And nothing can cleanse you except the blood. So every one of those things that are in the book of Revelation being removed, there is a shaking that is happening and new things are coming. They're all because of the blood that speaks. There is a voice that now is speaking that is shaking both heaven and the earth. And it's the voice of the blood of Jesus. And it's all in you. Amen? Amen. Amen.